I don't give a, f- I don't give a rat's butt about Google. Okay. Like they're just a big company. They, they don't mean anything to me. What means something to me is you have a business and you have a life and you only have so many chances to get this right. And my job is to help you as best I possibly can get this right. This is Super Fast Business with James Schramko. James Schramko. Helping you build your business super fast. 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 James Schramko here. Welcome back to superfastbusiness.com. Today's guest is an absolute legend in the internet marketing space, primarily because of his founding work with the Google AdWords platform. And I'd love to welcome Perry Marshall to the call. James, it is great to have you here. Um, and it's great to have met you in person a few weeks ago. It's great to have you on the back of my 8020 book, which my marketing guy, Jack Bourne, hooked us up. And it, it was a pleasure to know you and meet you. And a, like a, a systems guy, an 8020 guy, uh, kindred spirits. We are. It's, and we've had so many friends in common, uh, especially a lot of the people who have come from your training. One of my f- friends, Mike Rhodes, is a real, I guess he's a mentee and student of your stuff and has gone on to do some amazing things with his own practice. Yes, he has. Jack's a tremendous guy. He's been wonderful discussions there with him and he's gone off and developed solutions in interesting markets as well. Mm-hmm. And I think we met very briefly at a Jay Abraham event, but it was a short event and it was a high caliber event where we were all focusing very much on our own solutions. <laughs> oh, yes, that's right. That's right. I remember that. So, so it's, yeah, it's very nice to, to meet you and, you know, you're, you're making it happen down under and kind of a legend down there. Well, I want to take you back a little bit uh, a few years ago. Very early on in my uh, internet marketing life cycle, I remember giving a, a lift to somebody to the city from an internet marketing conference, my first internet marketing conference that I went to. And he was telling me about his business model and it was buying traffic on Google and then selling things and he was making more profit from the things he was selling than what it cost to advertise. And he was just doing that. That was his whole business model. And I asked him more about that. And he produced a folder and it had the definitive guide to AdWords by Perry Marshall. It's this red sort of cover, I think. And I then went and explored your website and I saw your approach. I think it's the first time I learned about a white paper. Mm. And I also noticed how clean and simple your websites were. They were were kind of really white with just text and they were logical. And I connected with that a lot more than I could the huge red screaming headlines and the the cheesy, hypey stuff. So it was really the first time I saw someone marketing more in a way that I could resonate with. So Mm. I I definitely have to credit you with being an early influence on the way that I felt my consulting side of the business might look many years ago. Wow. Well, you know, some of that was just me being irritated at how everybody else thought marketing was supposed to be done. You know, like uh, people seem to think if you scream at people loud enough, they'll start to believe you. Like, well, this makes no sense to me. Like, why don't you say something believable? That might be a good start, right? Yeah, it's like it was. It was such a contrast. So, well done for being different. Now, I'd love to talk about how you managed to pick such a giant to piggyback because Google has really gone on to get a lot stronger since you started out. Did you see this coming or did you just pick an advertising platform as as it was developed? You you were just there at the time and you thought this makes sense? Well, you know, that's a great question. Well, first of all, I I could not honestly say that I foresaw where Google was going like the closest I could say to that was when I went to my first internet marketing seminar, which was Ken McCarthy's and John Keel spoke on pay-per-click, which was where I learned about pay-per-click. I had noticed how eBay maybe a year or two before had really secured their position as the number one auction site. And I remembered 
how like Yahoo and some other guys had really made a valiant effort to unseat them and they couldn't do it because of the network effect. You know, they get more buyers, which you get some more sellers, which gets some more buyers, which gets some more sellers. So the winner is going to like really take all, right? And so at the time, the search engines were still all bleeding money. And I remember asking John the question. I said, so is there like a similar phenomenon as we've had with eBay where one search engine is just going to naturally dominate? And he goes, I don't know. But my gut told me that one search engine was going to dominate. What I couldn't foresee at the time was all of the bells and whistles that would eventually come along with a search engine. Like I couldn't foresee YouTube or Google Maps or like all this other stuff. I don't know whether Gmail even existed or not then. And so like, you know, I, <laughs> I couldn't really pick that. I was really, all I can tell you is... I saw that they had created the most amazing direct marketing machine ever. I figured that out a week later. Like, wow, oh my goodness, look at what you can do with this. The other thing, you know, you said it would be okay to do rabbit trails. The There is one other thing, though, which I actually think was, was pretty important. And so it, it was a year later. And what it was, was... I had learned about the 80-20 principle. I had uh, read Richard Kosh's book. Now, I already knew about 80-20, but he pointed out something that I had never understood before, which is that 80-20 is fractal, that there's this infinite repeating pattern, that there's an 80-20 inside every 80-20 and that it keeps going. And he had just kind of mentioned this, but I had latched onto it and my mind set on fire and I was already obsessing about this. And I remember this one particular day, and it was a Friday, I was sitting there and I was going, this is a calculus formula, because I'm an engineer. And like I like saw all these things, and I'm like, how would you figure this out? I can't figure this out. I, I don't know how to solve it. And I was obsessing about this all day long. And the other thing I was obsessing about all day long was I had, I, I won't go into the details, but I had just scored my first internet marketer home run. And I had made quite a bit of money um, that week. And it was a caveman discovers fire moment. Okay. You ever had one of those? Like, oh, oh my word. Wow. You know, I just made more money in one hour than I usually make in a month. That will change your perspective on things. And, and what I was thinking about was, wow, well, you know, my brother-in-law has got this project in Mozambique and they got the school and they got the, this feeding program and, these people are really poor and I'd like to go there someday and I wonder what I could do to help that. And I was thinking about those two things all day long. And after dinner, my wife right. goes, Hey, you know, they're having this music oh, yeah. thing at church. You, if you want to go, I'll, I'll watch the kids. So I'm like, well, okay. So I go to this thing and they're playing music and I am totally in la la land and I'm just standing there and I'm staring into space and I'm thinking about calculus and I'm thinking about Mozambique and all of a sudden I look up and this woman is making a beeline for me and it's this black lady. I've never seen her before. I don't know who she is. She walks right up to me and she sticks out her hand and she shakes my hand and she goes, Hi, my name is Vivian, and the Lord gave me a word for you. I'm like, what? Like, w w this is weird. And she goes, the Lord told me that you were very, very good at math, and you're working on some kind of equation or some kind of formula or some kind of invention. You're going to figure it out. Just keep working. You're going to figure it out. And I just look at her like, how many people are working on a math problem? right now <laughs> okay i mean it was spooky and she turns to walk away and then she wheels back around and she goes oh and he told me something else too you want to support missions and god is going to bless your business so you can support missions I'm like mozambique feeding program orphans kids wow so you had a very strong driver a reason why right then yes i did i did 
yeah. And, and I'm, I just stared at this lady with my mouth open and I was almost on the verge of tears because she read my mail. I mean, it was like, wow. And I mean, I could have maybe possibly shrugged off the first thing as a coincidence, maybe, but getting both of those right at the same time. And I go, if only you knew. And she gives me this big smile. She points her finger up in the air. She goes, he knows. And she just walked away. Just like that. Wow. That's, and I guess being an engineer, <laughs> that must be even more difficult to reconcile. Just strip my gears. Well, you know, look, I call them memos from the head office. They are much more common for me now than they were then, but I would say that was like my first one. And like, wow, that totally got my attention. And it affected me in several ways. First of all, like she told me, keep working at it. You're going to figure it out. Well, it actually took me three years. I figured out three years later. And, and I'm glad she told me that because I, I'm really not sure I would have pursued it. I would have been content to just kind of have a picture in my head and have this general idea, know about 80-20, but it, it, apparently it was important for me to actually get down to the math on it. So I did, and the, the math is actually the backbone of my 80-20 book. Now, it's a marketing book, and it's written for regular, ordinary people, and so you don't hear me like talking about calculus very much in there. But there's actually a whole mathematical backbone behind it. And the 80-20 curve, there's a lot of other things in statistics that are kind of like it, but there's none that are exactly like it. And none of them are easy as easy to use for a marketer as the 80-20 curve is. And it's at 80-20curve.com. And I, I think it was really was important. I know that it was. It, it's, it's actually become a major strategy behind everything that I've done in my business for the last 10 years. So that was one thing. Another thing that it did for me was it was, it was a kind of permission for me to, to succeed. Anybody who does what you and I figures out after a while that how successful people are actually has less to do with what you teach them and it has more to do with how receptive they are in their heart and in their mind to change from being failing a lot to being successful. And I think that's where the 80-20 has been a good tool to help people have or reduce down the amount of choice, choices that are possible, that the routes that they could take, and to, to make it much clearer and, and more obvious what needs to get done. And I think people build their self-belief, their confidence yep. increases when they start seeing results quickly because they're doing the right things, which is a Peter Drucker philosophy. So when I was reading your book, the really important point that came for me also was the fact that it's fractal. And I immediately started calculating, all right, well, let's just take this 20% for a minute here. <laughs> let's work out what's 80% of 80% of that. What's 80% of that 20%? It's probably 64. And what's 20% of the 20? It's probably four. Yeah. So I thought, wow, 4% of the stuff that I'm doing is probably getting me 64% of the results. There's a lot of stuff I'm doing that's really not that important <laughs> in the overall scale yes. of things. And I actually themed one of my events called Fast Web Formula 4 around this 4% idea. And my role as a presenter for my own topics was to only talk about the things that I felt represented the 4%. So I covered things like leverage, profit, and systems that my most successful students have nailed. And it's flowed right across into my mastermind at Silver Circle. Each week, all I'm looking for from my students is what's that one thing that's going to shift their business more than anything else? And it, it always is identified in advance in a 12-weekly in a stretch. And we're just focusing on that 4%. So what I've found is that even if someone doesn't believe themselves that they can do it in the beginning, because it's very common that people put artificial limiters on their performance mm -hmm. by just focusing on this 4%. And you used a word that I like, obsessive. <laughs> <laughs> if they could just obsessively focus on the 4% and even just let a lot of things ride, they're still going to get a result 
even if they don't have a vision from the Lord. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And and so so that was like that was a permission to succeed. And and then this started with you asking about AdWords. Well, so that was March of 2003, and a couple of years went by, and my business hit the hockey stick, and it went crazy, and it went crazy because of Google AdWords. And a couple of years later, I was like, wow, you know, she was right. Like, my business really did get blessed. And I went back and I looked at all the emails that, that had happened that week because I, I had a hunch I might find something interesting. And I did. I found that Tuesday of that same week, Ken McCarthy, he had asked me, who should I have speak at my uh, seminar on AdWords? And I said, you should get Andrew Goodman. And he went and asked Andrew, and Andrew turned him down. And, and Ken came back to me on Tuesday of that same week, just before the Friday where I met the lady named Vivian. And Ken said, Andrew turned me down. I think you should do this. And as soon as he said that, I knew what that meant. That meant that I was in the basically the AdWords book tape and seminar business. And that all happened right there. And like, I couldn't have foreseen where Google was going, but I believe that it, it was providential. And, and so it was like, I couldn't have done that. I think it was like, you know, the, the divinely thrown touchdown pass. Now, the thing about touchdown passes is you have to be prepared when they come to you. You have to know how to catch. You have to know how to run. You have to know what the plan is. You have to know what the game is. And, and I had done that. And another thing that I, that I also think is really important was I had deliberately carved out space. So I, so I had a year and a half before that, I had escaped the Delbert Cube. And I had started a consulting firm and I was doing this project work for clients and I made a very deliberate conscious choice. And the choice was, I am not going to fill up my time with consulting projects. I am going to spend half of my time on consulting projects. I'm going to make enough to live on and I'm going to spend the rest of my time building equity which I wanted to create info products and I, and I wanted to sell my intellectual property. And I, I left all this other space open for doing that. Now, when you are in a situation like that, what you spend most of your time doing is obsessing about what's not working yet. Right, James? <laughs> well, that's right. Unless you have, you know, these days there's a lot more tools with the lean startup movement and minimum viable products and build measure learn loops. But back then, I, I'd never heard of any of those things. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm sitting there. I'm like, well, how do I do this? How do I get traffic to my website? What do I do? And it was only because I had that space that I was doing experiments and, and I had time to discover something like Google AdWords and go figure out what it meant and how it worked. I think what you're des describing now is very common where consultants get trapped in, a, they're, they're basically, de they change from an employer to being their own boss in a shitty job <laughs> where they're paid by the hour. Yes. And my first tip for people in that scenario has always been to do one for you, one for me, right? one client job for one personal mm. job so that at least you can start becoming your own customer and building it. And I love how you put it, building intellectual property because the, inf the info products is good, but what you did that was so masterful is you built reputation. You, you became published and mm -hmm. you would have to be the world's foremost authority on Google AdWords to this day because of the work that you've done, even though that's not fully what you're doing anymore. Yeah, and there's another story I want to tell you about because I want you to understand all of this is very 80-20, okay? And so, like, there's a 20% of what you do that, that actually works and it actually pays your bills and all of that, okay? And what most people do is they spend 100% of their time doing what works, well, what you should really be doing is you should be spending 20% or maybe 50% of your time doing what works 
and you should be not deliberately not doing a bunch of other stuff, and then you should be deliberately doing something else that, from which the, the new opportunity is, is going to come from. Okay, so maybe it's exploiting the high end of what you're already doing and reaching to a higher level, or maybe it's going into a completely different area. But what my point is, is opportunities do not come unless you make space for them. Now, I want to tell another story about deliberately building reputation. It's kind of funny. So way back when, I think this was 2006, my roundtable group, our mastermind together, we all kind of decided that we believed we all deserved to have our own Wikipedia page. And we didn't really know much about Wikipedia, but what we did know is that you can't make your own bio. So we all like put names in a hat and drew names and, and uh, uh, you know, made them for each other. So somebody made me a Wikipedia page and like two days later, and by the way, by this time, it's like, I am the AdWords hot shot and like everybody, if I go to internet marketing conference, everybody knows who I am, which was, it was kind of a shocking thing, by the way, for all that to happen. It, it was quite an adjustment. But anyway, you know, some like, hey, you know, all these internet marketers, they all know who I am. So Wikipedia page goes up. Two days later, there's this message at the top of the page that says, this appears to be a vanity entry about a non-notable person. Please add references or this page will be deleted according to Wikipedia's guidelines. And I'm like, oh, references. So let's come up with some. There wasn't any, like none. Like no, nothing that a traditional publisher or you know, an academic source or anybody we, we consider uh, legit. I had like affiliate links is what I had. Okay. It's like, oh, you go speak at these like weird seminars that nobody's ever heard of. Like, so what? Okay. I was a complete nobody. And the Wikipedia page got deleted. And I'm like, hmm, you know, I probably need to fix this. And And the funny thing is, is, you know, at the time I was making, yeah, I had this little ebook called The Definitive Guide to Google AdWords. I was probably selling forty or fifty thousand dollars a month of this ebook. Yep. You know, and like when you're doing that, it's really easy to just convince yourself that you're like a total stud and that you're invincible. And and Jonathan Mizell has this great joke about like, you know, goes to an affiliate summit and he'll he'll see all these guys and they're like 19 years old and they're walking around and they got a Rolex and they think they're like really hot stuff. And he goes, "Dude, you know, 6 months from now that guy's going to be living in his grandmother's basement." Yeah. If he's not already in a sleeping bag under a desk, <laughs> you know. <laughs> But right. These guys have to work really hard all day so they can make money at night. Exactly. So, and and so my friend Dean Hunt says that one. Yeah, well they they do and 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 it's very volatile, especially you know these, you know, kind of really, you know, tenuous internet businesses. And so the long story short is I made a calculated decision. I said, well, you know, AdWords is below the radar right now, but it's going to be above the radar pretty soon, so I got an agent and I went and I wrote the ultimate guide to Google AdWords and I got a contract with Entrepreneur Press and I deliberately cannibalized this business. So I go from selling an ebook that's like 49 or 97 bucks and it's all margin to I've got a bookstore book and it's 25 bucks list price and it's actually $18 on Amazon and I make 10% on the wholesale price, which means I make a buck. So I go from making 100 bucks to making one buck on essentially the same buck. But what do I buy? I buy credibility. I buy premier position in the bookstores and on Amazon. Buy a Wikipedia. And yeah, and eventually... You know, I do have a Wikipedia page and I am somebody and somebody can go, oh, he's, he's cited in all these books, but I had to go above the radar for that. And I did cannibalize a whole business and I had to reinvent the whole back end of my business. So I still had a business when the other business went away. And, and it, it, 
do you see how this is 80 20 thinking all the way through you've really defined the goal and that was to build a proper business and yes it means that you have to do things a little differently instead of putting up the hammock at the side of the beach <laughs> on the surf safari you have to lay foundations and hire an engineer and get concrete and it takes longer it's more difficult and a lot of people won't build on solid foundations because it's too much hard work but you you did that and when you look back it does seem like a long time ago you know this is um been it's it's planting those seeds and building that orchard. You can pick the fruit anytime you like now. And now you've expanded into other things like the 80-20 market of that general business market. But you're also now toying around with Facebook advertising. Yes. Yeah. And do you think that's going to be as big, bigger, or are they done in parallel? What's your philosophy around these two? Well, so I think Google and Facebook are – you know, you could say apples and oranges. It's almost like apples and swordfish or something. I mean, they they are. You know, when when we first started researching Facebook, I was like, okay, this is a this is a pay per click system, and it's basically like AdWords. It's just different. I'm like, no, <laughs> actually, it's like a completely different universe. So I, I don't think one replaces the other. Uh, but what I would say is Facebook is not just a toy anymore. It's actually – it's the hottest thing going if you are in a somewhat consumer-friendly business. Now, if you're in like some really geeky business-to-business -business kind of thing, Facebook may not work And for you. And we have a little quiz at isfbforme.com where you can actually find out if you should even bother with Facebook or not. But Facebook is definitely a force to be reckoned with. Google is scared of them. Seriously, they, they, make, they make Facebook – Facebook makes Google very nervous. You know, about six months ago, I put out a press release and I predicted that Facebook would triple in the next two years. And I stand by that. I think, I think by summer of 2015, they'll be, doing, they'll be in the vicinity of $20 billion a year. And it's, it, it's a really interesting way of slicing the world. And the reason I – mean, Facebook, up until about a year ago, Facebook was a dog. Maybe 10 or 15% of the advertisers could actually get it to work. The rest of them, good luck. Well, it, that is funny because I was talking to Keith Krantz just a few days ago and I've got a whole podcast about Facebook advertising with him and I looked up my mm -hmm. account and I was advertising on there back in like 2007 or something ridiculous, like yeah. a long time yeah. ago and it was very experimental <laughs> back then for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they, they're going to change a lot more, I imagine. Do you know what – What's likely to come down the pipeline? Yeah. So the first major progress came when they started, they started buying big data um, and, in, and mixing it in w with their targeting options. So, you know, it used to be you could only target based on, you know, what people reported in their profiles and the things that they like and, and, and stuff like that. And now now you can target people based on income and value their home and a bunch of things and and now you're you're also starting to be able to get to target based on recent buying activity okay where they're going i mean i don't know exactly where they're getting the info i mean that, that's beyond the scope of of this conversation but you know people bought something related to boats in the last 2 weeks on their credit card or something they may actually be targetable as such on facebook and so google targets people based on what they are interested in and based on their online behavior, like what web pages they're on, Facebook advertises to people based on who they are, which is not what Google does. You know, so Google is interest targeted and Facebook is identity targeted. Well, in the grand scheme of things, all the growth in the economy is going to be in the who you are category more than it's going to be in the what you're interested in or what you can articulate 
category because I think in a lot of ways, the world has already configured itself to deliver people whatever they're searching for. You know, it, like people figured that out. It was new and exotic 10 years ago and, and I was part of that. Now it's not. Now it's like, well, what can you interest yeah. me in that I have never seen before that, you know, that I would never even think to go looking for, but as soon as I, you know, as soon as I stick my toe in it, I'm going to get sucked in and it's going to be the magic carpet ride. Like that's what people want. That's actually why people sit there on their phone and they open Facebook because they're looking for something surprising. So this is like a Steve Jobs effect. Yeah. You know, do you want predictive advertising that shows people what they don't know to ask for? Well, yeah, that's that's the name of the game. So, if, you know, it's, it seems to me that feature of being able to upload an email list is very powerful because yes. there's a good chance that, that that cohort, the other people who are in your system, have already explored some of those areas, but not everyone in that cohort or that group has actually found that yet. So you could see, well, okay, what's the pattern here? That's right. And and so if you can look forward and you and you can say, well, what? what would just knock these people's socks off, then you may have your next hit. So there's people getting wealthy all the time and, and more and more it's about the anticipation of what people are going to want more than it's about asking them. Of course, most people aren't even asking. So, you know, you're, you're, you're never going to do wrong by asking, but of course, you know, people wouldn't have asked henry ford for a car they would have asked him for a be better covered wagon yeah and, and it's i was actually researching that one a little bit too the oft attributed saying about them saying that, that uh, they'd ask for a better horse I, the family and the historians say they can't actually find where he said that um, oh really and by the way the henry ford documentary is one of the most fascinating documentaries i've ever watched what an really? interest, interesting man he actually which built, one I imagine there's more than one uh, there'd, there'd be a few but it was uh, pretty plainly named uh, and it was very long but one of the things that I really remember was he actually had this goal of building a factory that could build a thousand cars a day and then mm. when he had built it he hated it and he basically um, was very sad but he was almost forcing people to live a certain way. He'd even have people go around and inspect their house and make it part of their pay and everything else. Hmm. It's a really domineering guy, fascinating, and, and pretty much bullied his son, Edsel, to his, pretty much to his death, <laughs> like just a, a hard man. Like, but, a, but a fascinating wow. story. Now, continuing on with your story, I've got a couple more questions, and maybe I'm not sure if you get asked this one or not, but on your journey to becoming more reputable, enough to be put into Wikipedia. It appears you've done a lot of co-authorships. Mm. What could you share with us about that process, about having co-authors and, you know, like where are they now and was it good for them and good for you and, and did you need a partner? What was the strategy around that? Well, you know, in every case it was, you know, somebody else is better at part of this than I am. It, it's it's kind of interesting that the the only book I've published that doesn't have a co-author so far is the eighty twenty book, and that one that sort of that leverages very heavily off Richard Koch, right? It's yes, it it, it does, and he wrote the foreword and. You know, I might even co-author books with him in the future. I, we've become good friends, and, and I think the guy is just amazing. He, he's more amazing than I realized he was even, you know, before, you know, just from reading his books because I, I went and hung out with him for a couple days in Portugal a few months ago. That must be amazing. For me, that was what the Jay Abraham experience was. It was to meet someone who I'd really studied and to develop that character more. But, of course... A lot of the other people that I've learnt from are no longer alive. So mm. to be able to, to have that opportunity to meet a, a living inspiration in your world must have been surreal. Well, yeah. And, and, but, but the thing of it was, it, it was, well, actually, the guy was more impressive than I realized he was before I met him. Okay, so before I went and hung out with him, I didn't really realize that he only works an hour a day. 
I knew he was worth a couple hundred million dollars, and that's impressive. But I, I didn't realize he was doing it working an hour a day. I also didn't realize that he, you know, he hadn't written six books. He'd written 20, and some of them far uh, completely off the business topic. You know, so he's actually really got the mind of a professor and a researcher and not just a business guy. And I really admired that. It, it, it gave me this whole other picture of what kind of reality that I want to go create. I think a lot of us need to see something before we can really latch on to it. We need to see it somewhere. I mean, humans are imitators. I mean, we just are. You were asking me about the co-author thing. Well, you know, I came to understand fairly quickly that my forte is not in knowing all of the nuances of like a software platform. Like my job is not to be the expert on like every little wrinkle and bell and whistle in the Google AdWords interface. My, because like, that's actually not an incredibly valuable job anyway. And I'm not trying to put down my co-authors. That's why I have co-authors though. It's like they have to, somebody has to know this stuff, but actually my job is putting the whole picture together in setting the values and the culture of my entire audience and what we're trying to do for our customers. So like from the very first coaching that we started doing with AdWords, I, t- I would tell people at the very beginning, I would say, if, if you're getting all your traffic from Google AdWords one year from today, I have not done my job because AdWords is not the point of this at all. The point of this is AdWords is a place where you can get traffic so that you can fix all your funnels and you can build a sales machine and you can make the best sales machine in your entire niche so you can go get all the traffic and you get traffic anywhere you want. And that is your job. Like, I don't give a, I don't give a rat's butt about Google. Okay, like they're just a big company. They they don't mean anything to me. What means something to me is you have a business and you have a life and you only have so many chances to get this right. And my job is to help you as best I possibly can get this right so you can move on and have a successful business and do the things, you know, that you are created to do. Like that's my job. And so the co-author thing, it makes perfect sense because some people are great at like, they want to sit there and, and play with a platform and poke it and see how it pokes back, you know, and I get a bunch of people in my audience that are really good at, and the best ones, they, they turn into co-authors. So I have Keith Kranz and I have Tom Malash and I have Mike Rhodes and I have Brian Todd and they're awesome people. And I'm really thankful for them too. So what you've really done is champion your best students. You've you've actually given away your best and these people have supported you and partnered with you and lifted everything together rather than uh, defect and steal and all the malicious things you hear out there. Well, yeah, and and I I also came to understand that one of the most important things that I do is build a community. Oh, I'm, we're on the same page there. That's, that's pretty much my entire business model is lifetime community and support them with services and products and, you know, free content like interviews that can help them mm-hmm. be successful. And I, I found it's a really worthwhile thing. It's, I guess that's my Mozambique, yeah. if you like. Well, you know, James, and it's true. And people, I think a lot of times people don't realize, especially when they're new in something, you know, they get a new profession or – you know, like I remember when I started going to internet marketing seminars and all these geeks, freaks, and misfits managed to sort of crawl out of the woodwork and find their way there. And here we all were sitting at the bar. You know, I didn't really realize that, you know, dude, do you realize at least a fourth of these people are still going to be around 10 years from now and they're going to be your friends and colleagues and you better treat them really well? <laughs> you know? 
like not everybody looks at things that way. Well, well you have you have a, a f- actual strategy around this. When we first caught up, you had you firstly had pre said hello before the event, which was very nice, and you had a dossier of all the speakers, and you'd circled the names, and you're on a mission to locate them and say hello, uh, which is a very strategic, b very clever, and I'm sure that that this. You know, I've always been saying to my audience, go to live events. You've got to go to live events. That's the lifeblood of an online business is the connections yes. you make. They're long and, and lasting. And it enables things like this for us to be able to have a conversation and talk about things. So I'm sure that strategy went really well for you. Well, it did. I, I learned it from Larry Benet, who is like the king of networking. And, you know, networking is is this word that kind of – to most people, it means like going to some meeting and passing out business cards as fast as you can, uh, you know, which is <laughs> – Yeah. I actually had Larry on my show uh, talking about this. He managed to uh, network himself onto this podcast but also has introduced me to a lot of other people and I think he was also at that Jay Abraham event. Yeah. And, you know, and Larry, he really, really is a brilliant, resourceful guy. And, and it's true. Like the best connections you make are the ones face to face in the bar, you know, or, you know, wherever you're hanging out and having a real conversation. You, you never get a full sense of who somebody is until you meet them. And, you know, people need communities like, you know, this is how, well, like when the economic crash happened after 08, the only reason a lot of people kept their head above water was they had friends, you know, or there's a big giant Google slap and all of a sudden you are nowhere to be found on the internet and 90% of your customers just went away overnight. Well, if you have friends, you can probably figure out some equitable way for them to send you some customers. Yeah. <laughs> And if you don't have friends, well, you know, rest in peace. <laughs> cool. Now, I want to touch on one other thing, and this is a topic around your bobsled runs. Mm. I had this memory of you having people to your house at a very small mastermind sort of workshop. And there was another marketer doing something mm-hmm. similar at about the same time. And I thought, wow, that's a, that's a pretty cool idea. And I actually ended up running four silver circle intensives at my house and i think the the earliest memory of that is the bobsled run yeah can you tell us about the the process how did you arrive at that idea and do you still do it yeah so well it's 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 all back to 80 20 so i i was selling the definitive guide to google adwords and for a long time i didn't really have any expensive products and my friend bill harrison came to me and and he goes, Perry got a million dollar idea for you, and he, and he in detail he explained the idea of okay, so you have a coaching program, and you know you get some one on one calls and some group calls, and, and you go through material and you take them through a process, and it, it lasts for so many weeks. And so I looked at that, and I go, well, so based on eighty twenty, and this number of people spent a hundred dollars, how many of them would spend two thousand or five thousand? And I came up with a number, and and he's like. And I'm like, well, this is how many we should sell if I do a good job with a promotion. And sure enough, that's how many we sold. So, you know, I'm just climbing the ladder. One fifth the people will spend four times the money is the rule. And so I did that. Well, so then we, we got that all figured out. And I'm like, well, what what's next after that? So I know that if X number of people would spend 2500 then... Why number of people would spend seventy five hundred or ten thousand? I know this for a fact. It's like a law of physics. So, what would they pay that much money for? And so I thought, well, what if I did like this two day coaching thing in my house, and everybody gets a half a day to work on their business, and everybody helps them? And so I came up with that, and that's how the four man intensive was born. And we still do them. I'm doing one in about two weeks. I do them every few months. And, and so and that is actually my single best way of completely, totally, and thoroughly understanding my customers. Yeah, it's like that's, I, I have a weekly call with Silver Circle, and it's like, my, it's like paid CRM. I'm in tune with my top customers every week. I have a mm-hmm. mastermind with my 
other community, the Superfast Business Membership, and they are my uh, my other top customers. So I'm basically connecting with them every week live, and there's no substitute. It is a little bit more work, but it's still a, a one-to-many format where you can help more people. With the same one hour, I can help 30 or, or more people, and it's yes. a, a wonderful way to do that. So well, I was just going to say um, – We've covered a few things. One thing I didn't cover that I, I did want to ask about because Mike Rhodes has mentioned it before and it's quite a, a pivotal tool in your toolkit is this concept of the Swiss Army knife. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, let's wrap up on that one um, because, you know. You like how it, I'm just cherry picking all your greatest Oh, hits? it's, it's <laughs> just, it's, uh, I appreciate it. it, it I mean, it, I can tell that you pay a lot of attention. Uh, which I appreciate. So the Swiss Army knife was born out of the uh, realizing that everybody learned how to split test stuff. And then everybody was apparently just split testing the same narrow variations of ideas over and over and over again. And it was inspired by my studies of biological evolution and evolution is a badly misunderstood topic. There, if you go to a typical college, typical university, typical science class, typical book in the bookstore, what it will tell you is that you know DNA has these random changes and copying errors and things, and and just out of the process of survival of the fittest, occasionally improvements show up. Well, that's actually. Very, very misleading because what cells actually do is they cut, splice, edit, and rearrange their own DNA. And they appear to follow some kind of algorithm that is just probably makes Google look like a bunch of elementary school kids. I mean, it's, it's really astonishingly amazing. It's the engineering – evolution is like the engineering feat of, of – of, of the universe. It's, it's amazing. Well, I started studying this and, you know, there's microevolution, there's macroevolution. I said, the, these organisms actually know how to make drastic changes based on what's going in the, the environment. Somehow this tree knows to grow these roots down to the ground and have a second set of roots. And it, it sent me on this journey. And what I ended up with was this systematic creativity method of creating new ads and so you go through this process and make this matrix and you now have the ability to generate an infinite number of new ads that nobody's ever seen before you know and you know it's a little geeky for the typical marketer but i do find that for advanced marketers they just absolutely love it and they rave about it and you know the funnest thing i do in my life just about is inventing stuff like that i just you know wow you know, how did I get so fortunate to have a job where I can invent stuff and get paid for it? What a, what a great thing. Very cool. So could you give us an example of how it works? Yeah, so we go through a brainstorm process. And what we do is we, we make a map of the customer's emotions and their, and their emotional landscape. What do they love? What do they hate? Who's their friend? Who's their enemy? And, and a whole bunch of other questions. And we, we build out a, a bunch of answers to each question. And then we, we create permutations. So we go, all right, so I'm going to write an ad about their best friend and their worst enemy. And then I'm going to write another ad about the thing they love and a the thing they hate. And I'm going to write another ad about a, a positive force in their life and a negative force in their life. And then I'm going to do an ad about a positive force in their life and their worst enemy. And like I'm just giving you a tiny sliver, but but we do this and it always produces yeah. ads that you would have never thought of by yourself and they're different from anything your competitors are doing and they're relevant to your customers' emotions. Yep. And so it's such a powerful thing. And so you can beat any ad, you can beat any control. You can you can out smart any competitor at least in terms of what they're saying in their ads you know because because you're doing this and i i think it it actually mimics what living things are doing when they intentionally adapt 
to their environment. And it's why if you go to the Galapagos Islands, it almost looks like, you know, the creatures there were custom made just for there. Well, it's it's not because God beamed the zebras, you know, onto the savannah like Star Trek. It's because God made the zebra with the innate ability to adapt or, you know, made the first cell with the, the ability to adapt. And then you have this adaptation. And so a lot of what we're doing is trying to be half as good a, 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 at what we do as nature is. And there's a, there's a whole field called biomimetics, which is how do you imitate living things and borrow the smarts that they already have? Uh, I, I believe that the cell has the answer to every technological question that we are currently asking if we just have the humility to go consult it and see how it does what it does. Nice. Well, I think this uh, is, is all worth looking up. Now, you've got a page set up for your book. It's cell8020.com. Yes. That takes people to the right page where they can check mm-hmm. out the 8020 book. Um, I loved the book. I was very pleased to be able to read it a little bit before everyone else. <laughs> Thank <laughs> get you. get time to adjust. Uh, the, the, but it was one of the very, very best books that I read, and I read a lot of books. So it's an absolute privilege to have you here talking about your stuff. And uh, it was great to catch up again, and I hope we get to catch up many times more as it's a long game, isn't it? It's a long game and uh, I am sure that we will. And uh, you know, I, I appreciate the, I don't the logic and, and the, like the, the way that what you do, it's thought through, it's organized and systematic and there's a creativity within that, those systems. It's, it's not rigid. It's, you know, it's flourishing. So appreciate that. Awesome. Well, well, we'll have a discussion underneath this post, and I'm sure there'll be a few questions here and there. So, Perry Marshall, thank you so much for catching up, and uh, we'll speak soon. Thank you, James. Take care. Discover how to build your business super fast. Check out superfastbusiness.com. Thank you.